all our guests joining us this evening. My name is Matt Hall and I'm the Director of Marketing Admissions at the Australian International School in Singapore. Before we get started this evening, there's just a few administrative tasks that I'd like to attend to. Uh, first of all, if you could just turn your microphones off, it just helps keep our, sign, our sound quality uh, through the webinar, which will be terrific. However, today's uh, webinar is interactive and therefore if you've got any questions that get posed as Brad and I have our conversation, please write them in the chat box. Uh, we will at the end have a, a designated time where we can talk freely and if you've got anything you'd like to ask Brad, myself, we can, um, we'll answer them then. So that'll be terrific. This is our third episode of the year in our webinar series called Into the Classroom where we celebrate many of the talented educators across our three sub-schools. Today, we're featuring Brad Cates from our elementary school. Brad is a talented cricket player who in his young years had a semi-professional cricket career before studying a Bachelor of Education and starting his teaching career in Auckland in New Zealand. He met his wife and moved to Australia, where he recently taught in the prestigious Somerset College before moving to Singapore. At AIS, Brad teaches in year five, where he prepares the students for the PYP exhibition and is the proud father of two beautiful children, Asher in the early years and Amelia in year one. Welcome, Brad. Thank you, Matt. That's a lovely welcome. Thank you very much. And I'm uh, certainly excited to be here. I just gave a bit of a brief um, outline to your career before coming here. Can you just talk us through um, where you started, perhaps where you studied, and just a bit more detail of your journey before coming to AIS? So you touched on it very nicely, Matt. But um, yes, I, I hung up the cricket boots and, and, and the whites and embarked on a, a teaching career. Uh, firstly, I trained through uh, the U University of Auckland, and that's where I did my initial teaching in Auckland, and I taught for uh, eight years in and around Auckland. And then, as you mentioned, I met my lovely wife. Uh, I moved to Sydney firstly. Uh, mm. I taught for two years at a private girls' school called Winona. And then we moved to the Gold Coast, and I was teaching at Somerset College for four years prior to coming to AIS, and that was when I was introduced to the, the IB and the PYP, or the Primary Years frame, uh, Framework, as it's uh, known as. You, you've just touched, touched on a point I was going to come up with. At, at AIS, we teach uh, the Primary Years Program, the International Baccalaureate. Can you tell the audience who don't know what that means and perhaps some of the teaching philosophy behind the program? So the Primary Years Program is an inquiry-based uh, program. Um, the big focus is the, the learner as a whole and developing that learner as a whole. So it's the, the academic side, um, socially, um, physically, culturally, um, and emotionally as well. And a big emphasis is on that process of learning. So we want our students to be aware of and understand how they learn best. Um, by developing this, um, our learners become lifelong learners. Um, they're, they're globally minded um, and they're able to adapt and, and um, thrive um, in our ever-changing uh, world. I, I've often seen us talk about units of inquiry with this, but what fascinated me when we were having some pre-conversation is you said that this that this in, way of teaching through inquiry, you do through everything. And I've got this wonderful slide that you showed me about a maths unit. Um, can you talk the audience through what's happening in, in this slide and talk about the inquiry going so, on? So mathematics is, is not just happening in the classroom. Mathematics is happening outside. So you can see uh, two students are outside when we looked at uh, measurement. They're uh, measuring um, the playground. Uh, it's, it's hands-on. They're using concrete materials uh, that are engaging, they are fun, and it makes maths, um, and it helps our students to develop that sort of growth mindset, that can-do attitude. At times, our students think they are not good at maths or uh, I'm not strong at maths, but by making it fun and engaging, it, that, that engagement and that fun factor develops that, that growth mindset in their maths. I was looking at, we've got a beautiful little picture of the H and then we've got some cubes. Can you talk about the learning that's happening in these two? So, so Matt, that's a video that we can share shortly, but we are able to use our many digital technologies and right. we're able to share these digital technologies through our Seesaw, which is our parent portal. 
so parents can also see what's happening in the classroom, in particular here with their uh, mathematical learning. Let's, let's have a look at the video. I think I've just got it here. If you just bear with me, I'll just double check here. I've got one. Oh, I've got on perimeter. Let me play this for the audience. And then you can tell us what's going on. Okay. What, what I, I did, did is I calculated how long each side was, and then, and then I, I added them all together. together. The perimeter of this is age, this is 64 centimeters. Hmm. To calculate, calculate the area, area I put the age to three rectangles. A, B, and C. A was 26 centimeters squared. B was 8 centimeters squared, and C was 26 centimeters squared. I have added them all together, and the area is 60 centimeters squared. First Pause it there, Brad. So it, it gives it, it gives our students agency, Matt. They're they're able to uh, pick a platform um, to share their learning and their understandings, and that and that's a big factor of inquiry learning that they are showcasing their learning in a number of different ways. And as I mentioned earlier, it, we are able to then upload that to our seesaw, and so the parents can also see the learning that's um, happening in the classroom. I will also add mathematics is, yes, it's um, hands on. There is um, times where we're at, we will be out of the classroom, but there's also moments where there is going to be explicit teaching happening as well. So um, students will practice problems or equations in grid books just so they are getting that, um, that practice as well. Seesaw, that's intriguing. You said that you upload it and you're learning. How else do you use that? Can you talk me through it? Because I'm actually new to Seesaw. I haven't seen it in action. So Seesaw is a platform where we as a teacher and ultimately the student is able to share their learning um, and share their learning and their growth throughout the year with um, parents. So learning that's happening in maths might be shared, learning that's happening in language and units of inquiry, um, also in PE lessons and in music and, and so forth. It's a wonderful platform that we um, have available here at um, AIS. And so, so they they are using technology, videoing what their learning is, and then they're uploading, and the parents can see that. So is that just does it send out messages? How do people know when things are coming up? Yeah, so when parents are logged in and signed up to um, Seesaw, there is a particular um, notification bell. It may be an email, and with with our uh, Seesaw posts, the parents are able to also make comment. Um, as well as the teacher. I like that. That's a nice way, nice affirmations for the children reading it and having a look at that. Exactly, because feedback is very powerful. Absolutely. I, I I thought it was limited, like you say, I was, I was really interested when you're talking about the maths and the inquiry in maths, but I, I was also very intrigued at how you then build on this even uh, when, when you're looking at the literacy. Um, this is a beautiful slide with a lot of different learning on it, which we'll we'll go through different pictures and unpack it. But talk me through it. And tell the audience what we're looking at here, Brett. So once again, uh, learning through inquiry does occur in in language. So the 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 images on the right hand side are of um, our students that undertake um, spelling. So spelling is also inquiry based. Stu uh, students are given agency to mm -hmm. explore. Uh, various word patterns, um, sounds, um, spelling rules. And so what happens in a, in a fortnightly basis, students participate and complete a number of um, word sorts or hunts or activities or, um, and then again, um, share those um, through um, a number of different digital te um, technologies available to them. But as a teacher, if I notice that a student might uh, not understand understand a particular rule or, or a word pattern, then I'm bringing groups down with me to the mat. And so there is, a, once again, that explicit teaching that is occurring alongside that sort of inquiry um, nature of our spelling. Gosh, it certainly has changed from the days that perhaps me and you were taught with the spelling, the rope learning, right. out of context, just it was, what, 10, 10 spelling words a week right. type thing, and then 100 <laughs> sort of thing. That, that, that was wasn't it? That's right. Pre-test on Monday and the post-test on Friday. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's right. I think it's nice when they start to see those real reoccurring patterns in words, they, they then can use their own phonic understanding and they can start to pick, bring them together in big like meaning. 
I, I mean, you've got a beautiful picture here of um, I think it's two young, young girls there reading together with a, uh, a book each right next to each other, wearing their masks too, which is outstanding. But can you tell me what's going on here? So a great initiative this year in the elementary school, Matt, has been the um, introduction of reading partnerships. So yeah. uh, to start the year, the students uh, create a reading ad to advertise themselves as a reader, their, their, their likes, um, the way that they, they read, um, the speed in which they read. Yeah. And then they find a like-minded reader as themselves and then they form a reading partnership. And so at least three times a week uh, as a reading partnership, they meet, um, they read, and they're reading books that they have chosen, um, authors that they're interested about, um, genres that um, kindle their um, excitement. And they also, while reading, are working on a, on a, once again, a digital platform where they are able to discuss um, what's happening in the book. It might be um, themes, um, characters, um, dialogue. Um, they might have found some wow words that they can then use in their writing, um, um, talking about things like uh, predictions, what's going to happen next, etc. And because it's a, a digital platform, I am able to also um, see as their teacher the dialogue that is taking place. Wow, that, that's insatiable. What a wow word. What? So a wow word a is, a, is an exciting, descriptive word that they could then possibly use in their, um, in their writing. So, yeah, we call it wow words. <laughs> I know. I, I like it. Just as explicit as it sounds. I'm pleased I asked more about that. That's great. But, yeah, that's awesome. I think well, what's this picture? It looks like um, this one at the bottom right. The student's taking a photo of the, the, the words here. Can you talk me? Yeah, what so, are so as I mentioned in their spelling, they, um, they complete a number of um, various tasks or what we call sorts. Um, and then so they capture that sort or that learning and then they can upload it and then they can share it with myself. So then I can give some, um, some feedback and I can also notice if there's any misunderstandings happening with, um, with their spelling. Gosh, that's such an easier way than I, I guess like we did. We had to re we had then had to record all that and write it, like you know, write it all down just for the teacher to see, really, whereas they can do the actual hands-on activity, right? Take the photo, and it's re it's really nice for you to be able to give the feedback um, to them. How often, you know, it's obviously there's two exa beautiful examples there, but how often are they using their iPads? Um, during class sessions and things, um, it's 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 always close by, Matt. It's either capturing um, yeah. images of their work, um, finding out definitions of words, um, using a particular application to uh, showcase their understandings. Um, it's it's used regularly. I I I love that because I think there's such a you know I I've been in schools where I've seen um, technology used rather poorly, where it is just a Google search, right? Yeah. It, 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 which is nothing, whereas I, I love the way that you guys are using it to engage learning, create new thinking. Uh, record, recording learning is such a beautiful one, isn't it? Exactly, that's right. And, and, and as I mentioned, the great thing about it, it's, it's instant. You can see it instantly, um, and it's fantastic. And often the students, when, they, when they're placing their iPads back in the loading dock to charge overnight, it's down to 3 or 2%, that, so they've used it all day. Oh, I, I love that. I know that at the start of a unit of inquiry, you guys do what's called a provocation. And a, and a provocation is a, a, correct me if I'm wrong here, please, but a provocation is an activity or something that you do that's designed to get the children's interest, but most importantly, to get them to think. And when we were chatting around this, you had um, some amazing video that you showed me that I want to play first and then you to tell the audience about what's going on. If the audience just bears with me for a second while I bring up the correct video, but I'll just play this and then you can tell me what's happening at the end of it. Right, Brad, what's going on in here? This is, right. this is 
Yes. Got me wondering what's going on. People may have watched this and thought, what just happened there? So yeah. um, that was what we call silent teacher morning. So for three periods on a Monday morning, all teachers in year five did not did not speak. Did not make a noise. Did we acknowledge the students, of course, but we did not speak to them. So that was our provocation or our way of introducing our new unit of inquiry under the umbrella of how we organize ourselves. So this inquiry is all about decision making and, and governments and, and the hope that governments uh, decisions are always made with the citizens uh, best interests. So the decision making was taken away from the teachers, of course, and given to the students. The student, uh, we as the teachers were, were, were present, um, but we were, we were quiet. And it was very interesting to see um, how some students um, found it uh, just too much. It was just like, this is um, too um, unnatural or not, not normal. And others really took it upon themselves to say, right, I, I can see Mr. Cates is not speaking here, but I can see on the board, period one, we are doing this. And so some students took it upon themselves to try and lead or make decisions on behalf of the class. So it's a, it's a great way, Matt, of showcasing and um, sh showing our students that in, in life and in, in society, there are leaders and groups of people that do make decisions on your behalf and that you always hope that um, decisions made are for your best interest. So obviously in, in the student's case, the teachers do make decisions on their learning and you would always hope that the teacher makes it for, for the right reasons. Gosh, what a, what a fascinating way for that. They must have been sparking with what's going on here in the morning when they worked out. They must have thought yeah. of your, your voice. Uh, all all right. the senses, they might, might have thought Mr. Cates has gone mad. Right, so you get you get the occasional post-it note written, um, <laughs> why aren't you speaking to me? Or, <laughs> Is it, is it okay that I move to such and such a seat? So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great morning. It really is. Oh, that, that must have sparked so much thought. I love that because it's so engaged. The children would have been looking at each other, right. looking for those leaderships. I, what I put up just while you're talking there, Brad, was I, I put up the, uh, the slide that's got that, um, uh, that um, video in it. But can you talk us through the other things that are going on? This is the unit inquiry that you're talking about. Yeah, so to the left, we see a, a, an image of our uh, fantastic headmaster, Mr. Casson. Yeah. And so later that same week, we were very lucky to have Mr. Casson, Dr. Grogan, uh, Mrs. Howarth, and Mr. Patterson to um, give us their time via a Google Meet. So the Year 5 students um, uh, created and crafted some questions to ask of our leaders and our decision makers of our, uh, of our school. And, and ultimately what came from those um, questions and answers is that uh, Mr. Casson um, elaborated, and I'll, I'll speak on his behalf, he said that all decisions that I make or that we make are always a group decision. They're well thought out, they're, they're considered, and at the end of the day, any decision that is made is made with the students' best interests um, at heart. I really, I really love that, and I, I think, well, isn't it fantastic that the head of, I know Andre very well would just love the opportunity to be able to talk to the children and, and to be able to share it with them. What's going on with the one, there's the green piece of cardboard there, and there's a group of uh, students. Talk me through that. What's going on in this? Prior, prior to speaking to um, the leaders of our school, we, we yeah. gave them images of different um, people and we asked them to to work out, I guess, the, the leadership structure or the hierarchy within our school. Um, and some students um, created it like an umbrella. Um, so there's an umbrella uh, leadership system in place at our school, or others um, introduced them as it's a spiral effect. Some mm. students had Mr. Casson as our, as the, um, let's say, the ultimate um, head of our school. Others, yeah. the students as the head of the school. Oh, um, nice. Mr. Casson, uh, you know, came 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 in second. Um, others said that well, there isn't a, a, a hierarchy or a leadership model. That everyone is the same. So some people place all of the people side by side. So it's very very again a, a learning engagement or provocation that um, allow the students to express themselves. So after their group um, arranged the 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 leader, leadership structure in which in which they thought. AIS is, they then got to stand up in front of the class 
and share and explain and talk about well why did they place these people in in such in such an order it was really interesting oh i i i love that and the critical thinking going on yeah. right and and that's just with the provocations at very early stages of um this unit of inquiry so so when you when, when you hear when you hear those conversations you know that they're automatically engaged and they're thinking and they're excited with what with what's going to what's going to happen next I, I I just love the way that you've done that. I just want to note to the audience um, who are writing lovely questions in the side, I will come back and answer all your questions at the end. I've got some great ones, Brad, they've got about the reading, but I'll just, I'll keep going through as we're going through and then I'll I'll just make sure that they're aware that I definitely will come back to their their, their questions at the side and we'll, we'll go into those. Now, what, what you did mention there, Brad, is we talked about the critical thinking and I know that critical thinking was part is a big part of the PYP in a, in, a, in a part called the approaches to learning. And we've got this beautiful video um, with a student talking about critical thinking. I'll, I'll play it first, and then we can come back to what on earth the approaches to learning are for the audience. If that is that feel all right with you? Okay. Yeah. Let me just think. Here we go. Critical thinking. I love that. Is is that one student's work? Yeah, so um, that was from um, last year. So what we asked our students to do um, when we came back from home-based learning here in year five is to help us with our um, PYP exhibition is we created what we like to call a year five approaches to learning website. Um, and so the students became experts at one of the sub skills and all these videos were placed into to a website and if they needed um, help to to understand once again what was such and such a approach to learning, mm -hmm. they can then, then click on this website and it, these were these readily available videos um, made to them. So <clears throat> that young student there made the video up. Did they all make one up? Is that what you were saying? So I think you just said that. Is that what? Yeah, that's right. So um, they all had the opportunity to um, create in year five. So there was hundreds of videos made. Um, there, right. there would have been five or six made on the same particular skill, but every student yep. um, explained themselves in different ways and gave helpful hit, um, tips and hints on how they could possibly use this um, approach to learning. I'm just thinking, gosh, how engaging is that? Rather than just writing in your book, right, this is the approach to learning is, is metacognition, critical thinking, and you write a couple of sentences, but how much more engaged will a student be to make a cool video and then know that there's an authentic audience, someone, another student, who's genuinely going to watch and go, oh, right, that's what that's about. Right. And, and the students that I have here, here this year in Year 5 and 2021 are benefiting from those videos, and, and no doubt they will make their own. But, you know, it's, it's fantastic. You could even use them next year, Brad, couldn't you? Like you could say to the kids, these kids are like, this is, this is what the uh, year sixes have left for you as a present, right, and as an introduction. Exactly. And we, we also um, create these videos because we're obviously mindful of the, um, the safety measures that we had to um, work alongside to uh, keep our school open. So we had to think with, um, be more digitally minded, I guess, I guess, I guess I'm trying to say. Yeah, I like that. And I, you've touched on what I want to talk about next, which is, which is absolutely perfect, is 
last year with the COVID, it had a lot of disruptions to us. And I know the massive part of year five where you teach is at the end of year five and um, going into term four, if I'm not wrong, you do the PYP exhibition, which is where, and again, you can correct me and or add a bit more detail, is where the children celebrate and show everything that they've learned in an exhibition where they typically invite everyone into the classroom to see this exhibition like any sort of exhibition. Now, how on earth did you guys do that last year? Like, talk so us we had, um, Just like this year, we had an amazing group of teachers in year five uh, last year. So we, um, we basically revolutionized um, what the exhibition looks like for our students. We had to, of course, um, due to COVID-19. So we created um, a wonderful website. Yeah. Um, we also changed our sort of focus or our, our, our learning of the exhibition. So we made our students become more globally minded citizens. So what our students did was they selected and concentrated on a global issue that, that, they, that they were passionate about. And right. these global issues align themselves perfectly with the sustainable development goals so our students were also learning about the sustainable development goals some of the issues that our students um, looked at were things like um, animal poaching um, climate change plastics in our ocean um, uh, and the list and the list goes on the, the, the mature the mature and critical thinking and 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 what they would like to focus on and what they were passionate about was 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 mind-boggling and so not only could our students um, explain what was the issue, what were the, the causes and effects of these issues, but they also mm -hmm. were able to articulate well, what forms of action can we take as a 10 or 11 year old boy and girl to fix or eradicate or, or let people um, know about, inform them of some of these issues that are happening in our world. So it was, it was very, very, um, it was very, very powerful. And uh, I was very proud of what, what we um, produced last year. Uh, and that conversation that we had before this, you talked about, um, which you just said then was very much uh, looking at the planet and what we can do, globalization, really great themes. But you talked to me about taking action and not a big action, but something that the students could do. Can you talk me through that? Yeah, so I, I guess students, when they think about action or what can we do, they think about fundraisers. Well, let's raise some money for such a <laughs> cause, which is wonderful, don't get me wrong, yeah. which is fantastic. But we're trying to change our students thinking that they mm. can stand up for themselves despite their age and let people know, hey, look, this is happening in our world or let, let's make some small changes in our our own lifestyles or in our own, in our own homes to then hope that if everyone's making small actions or taking a, a slight change in their life, mm. that these will you know, snowball and become one big piece of, of action. I, I think that that's, that's a wonderful lesson for them to learn because sometimes for children it's, it's just getting started on a small action, isn't it? And, and knowing that that's a, that's a valid way to get started on it, isn't it? Right, exactly right. And, that, and that's what's happening in prep, I'm sure. Like it's not about big picture we think small yes. and then as we go through the years we can you know make slightly yes. bigger, bigger changes yeah and just that combine I, I i like that approach because it shows the children that they can have an impact doesn't it right you know right. exactly right and we know that we know that in our world we we are hearing more and more that there are younger people standing up for what they believe is right and taking a stand and um making action it's fabulous yeah, and we see you are dead right, and that's been, it's been, it's in the last couple of years that's really started to take force, isn't it? When you're seeing some very young, um, uh, young people taking some huge action, isn't it? It's absolutely terrific. I love the way that you're doing that. Um, I know we, we had to do a lot of things differently in when we were in the lockdown period, and we came out of it. And I know that one thing that we did do, and you can talk through the people. Who are unfamiliar with our school when we had the lockdown we had to do a lot of things digitally online and one of the things was when we had um, parent teacher evenings um, can you talk us through how you did those and whether you guys are carrying on with that can you tell us what you did so uh, yes so semester two and also at the beginning of this year we've had our parent teacher interviews which are very important um, to just to discuss the, the learning and the progress of all our students 
Right. But unfortunately, we, we're we unable to welcome our students into uh, the classroom and we can't meet um, face to face as we would. So we've been very lucky to engage in much like we are today, Matt, um, uh, dialogue and, and conversations um, and conversate uh, using a Google Meet, for instance, mm. uh, which has been which has been fantastic. So we are still having our regular um, conversations, but unfortunately, they just aren't happening. Um, in the classroom, in the classroom, face to face. So, to put you on the spot, Ray, what are you guys thinking about the exhibition at the end of this year? Is it? Is it? What? Where do you guys stand at the moment under the current? You doing something again like that beautiful um, website, or what were you guys? I'm thinking so at this stage because it was such a wonderful way to share and showcase um, and develop their their learning. So. I'm, I'm sure there'll be those digital elements um, once again, if not um, the entire um, exhibition may, may be like this. What is quite terrific, and I know we, we, we do the exhibition and it's internal, but I suppose you can share this, and I, it's what you're just saying there with the parents, is that you can share it to an even wider audience on a website. Don't you? Exactly. Like, you know, like, to the like, children all over the world that they could go on and look at different... Um, students PYB yeah. exhibitions right That'd exactly be... and, and that's what we do because we are a part of a, of a network of schools the IB is a network of schools so we are sharing our exhibition with uh, schools within Singapore or schools in Australia um, the Australian International School in Malaysia we touch base with um, the King's School in Sydney and and they do the same with us so before we embark on the exhibition journey we introduce our students to completed or finished exhibitions that have happened in, in Europe or, 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 or Australia. And so the, so the students learn from these students what's to come. And we can showcase and, and celebrate with these schools and with these students um, their, wonderful, their wonderful learnings. And we do the same once we have finished our exhibition. We showcase our exhibition not only with our parents and our, and our AIS community, yeah. but also globally. So we really are a, a global uh, network of schools working together for the common good of, of all our students. And and once again, and I sort of touched on it before, it's it's so powerful for a young learner to know it's an authentic audience. Right? There's someone who's genuine. They're not just writing a story or doing something for the sake of the task. Today is story writing or today is research doing it. And they get so much more engaged when they can someone's genuinely going to read it someone around the world is going to be engaged in it it's that's right and and, and the exhibition is is like the building blocks or the steps to be lifelong learners yeah. the exhibition is a wonderful way to show them that what's to come they they, they are ready to um in our case in year five yeah. um secretary school in year six next year and like I touched on before, Brad, you're about to show last year's exhibition to your current students, right? Exactly. Exactly. And so there's nothing stopping us sharing it now, So, which we are going to do very soon. So it, you're right. It's such a powerful tool. Um, the way we did it last year, um, due to the constraints, but in a way it's been almost a blessing. It's been a, a revolutionised, as I mentioned earlier, um, the exhibition for us here at um, AIS. Yeah, I bet other schools around the world would have watched that with excitement and gone, that's the way to do it. Yep, we're, we are very lucky to have um, a few people from our school um, presenting at the next uh, um, IB Asia Pacific conference and they're going to be sharing um, our conference and how we went about it and explaining um, where it started from through the journey and what the, the final product ended up um, looking like. So we're very excited to um, to share um, our successes here at AIS, but the purpose is obviously to show um, what can be done and hopefully help other schools um, around the world. Oh, this is a this is a great conversation. Yeah, you know, I can see why the kids are so excited. Um, I hear Brad that uh, the kids love being in your class, and I can see that in any class in Year Five. So it's absolutely terrific. I think. Um, now, we've got some really good questions that we sort of might dart back into what we've already talked about, but um, yep. let's just start to do some questions. So for anyone in our audience, please type away. 
I like to make sure because in the past what I've made the mistake of is not giving as much time uh, to the question and answer part because I think that's a it's such a valuable bit for the parents. But let's just go back here, Brad. I've got um, uh, Michelle loved your reading partnerships and they were asking about this. They were just saying, and I'm not sure if you're aware of, but do other year groups do reading partnerships? Can you? 100%, yes, uh, in upper elementary. So year three is a part of upper elementary and it is happening in year three, I assure you. Um, right. And as I said, the, the kids' excitement around reading partnerships because they're reading um, authors that they love, um, series of books that they also um, love. And I guess with that, we're giving our students agency. We're moving away from Matt um, sitting in a, a group or doing buddy reading with books that the teachers are giving them. The, the students are reading what they want want to read. And that's, uh, and, and I touched on it, but it, the big part of learning sticking in a child's brain when they're doing like their neuron pathways is is it self-driven right is it exciting about that right. the, the students are leading their learning well, what a beautiful way and i love the way when you said they they wrote a um an ad about themselves I mean, we'll just jump back to that i know we're going backwards and forwards but i like that can you talk a bit more about that what was that they so uh, i guess it's like a um writing an ad for 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 you know selling a bicycle so they, they sold themselves as a reader to 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 <laughs> encourage to cut to encourage a, a, a like-minded partner to say hey look yeah i want to read with this person because they love harry potter books or um they like um david williams books as i like funny books as well and and then but the, not only do they comment about authors and series of books that they like to read it's also about them as a reader they might have said, oh, I like to read books slowly or at times I'm inclined to read a chapter again if I haven't understood exactly what um, has happened in the in, in the book. How beautiful that the kids are even reflecting on the type of reader they are or being quite honest about that. Like, you know, I might, I might struggle with that. And we're lucky to have such a fabulous um, library department as well here at AIS that they are helping us. So they know what's happening in the classroom. So when students go... And visit the library you know i'm telling them in the classroom okay when you go to the library today and you see the lovely miss d why don't you yeah. um see if you can find a book for next time etc and, and and michaela in the library is, is helping with with us as well so there's that partnership happening within the classroom and with um, our library at the same time i i think that is terrific and i think that again that's the when we are a school of scale, and, and what I mean by that for people, we are a large school. Um, however, we're broken into our sub-schools, and like um, Brad just said then, even our elementary is broken into our lower elementary and upper elementary, and they're quite different sort of sites, so it's a mini. And then you go again into your sub-schools. But the, the, another great benefit is, is that we have the resources like a teaching librarians, don't we? Uh, exactly. And, and the, the their background's teaching, right? So they're not, that they were teachers, right? So they were teachers who you know. So that must be, yeah, that must be terrific. Oh, and during, coming back to the exhibition, Matt, we're very lucky that, you know, we our librarians, they, they help teach our students about writing a bibliography, um, how to uh, right. research, how to research um, correctly and take note takes and summarize what they are reading, whether it's through a book or for a website. So. The lessons happening in in library are by uh, a, a teacher, hundred percent, and and it's like encompassing. They're, they're helping grow our students um, as well. That's fabulous. And that's year five, Brad. That that's going yeah. on. Uh, it, I'm I'm blessed to be in a position where I am, um, Matt. I love teaching year five. Wow, that that is. Well, that blows, that blows me away, actually, to talk about uh, researching skills in year five and right and, and that level. It's pretty intriguing. We've got some more questions here. And then, and again, if you're not, if you don't have an answer, we can find an answer and get back to these parents. So please, parents, write anything that you'd like in the question box. Um, we've got a question here. What digital platforms for game-based learning are you using to engage them in hybrid classroom? You list a few. I'm not yeah, quite so sure. We are using a new platform at this year called Freckle. So Freckle is, is a is another wonderful um, sort of platform available where there are um, spelling games. And the good thing about Freckle is that 
they do like a diagnostic test at the beginning of the year to find their level. So they find their um, their level in spelling, um, reading comprehension, um, and also maths fluency. So once they have done or undertaken the diagnostic test at the beginning of the year, the, the, the games or the questions or the problems or the challenges are at their level. So um, that, that is a platform that we are using um, successfully uh, so far this year in the elementary school. Right. I, I, yeah, I think I've heard about someone else. We, we talked to one with um, uh, Dr. Klein and he was talking about Freckle and, and it's intuitive nature to know, for example, if a student, uh, they can all learn at their own pace. Is that right? Is that Correct. Yes, that's right. So there, there are some students that might fly through a question. And, and, yeah. and the good thing about Freckle is if, if a student is stumbling or finding something difficult, there is really, really um, available videos that they can click on where a concept or a theme is um, taught to them via, via a video clip or it's very, very intuitive. So it can pick up uh, a, a student got, let's say, three out, three out of 10 in this particular area. Mm -hmm. um, the next time they log in, we're going to um, narrow down and focus again on this particular skill or, or, or theme or what it might be. That's, that's fantastic. I've got a question here. Um, uh, Judith said, oh, that sounds, she said it sounds interesting. <laughs> um, is it spelled at, as Freckle Education? R-F-R-E-C-K-L-E, Freckle? Yes, with yeah. a capital F, that's the one. That's it. And I think it actually, and I, um, I know we just both said maths, but I think they do spelling in it. That's right. it? It's got spelling as well, doesn't it? Yeah. It's, it, it's encompassing spelling. Um, you can do reading, so students can read a uh, read a passage, and then there are questions, and and those questions can be um, focused or narrowed in, in into a particular um, reading strategy or reading comprehension strategy. Um, there's um, fact fluency and maths occurring as well, but also you can set them if you're let's say working on uh, um, area or perimeter and volume, you can yeah. set particular tasks on that particular theme as well. So it's a it's a wonderful platform um, that we have available. So in my classroom, I'm using it um, as like um, 10 minutes um, before a break or, or 10 minutes after a break. And as you mentioned, Matt, it's, it's, um, it's, you can pick it up, you can, yeah. you can take off from where, from where you left last time. Uh, I, when Bradley talked about it, I was pretty excited to hear about it. So I thought it's just such a great way of using you know, the AI, machine learning, each child getting its own pathway. It's a, um, and then I was blown away because I just thought initially it was mass, but like you just said, it does everything, reading, comprehension, spelling. That's, right. That's absolutely amazing. I've got a great question here from Jeslyn, and this is, um, do, we, uh, do we need to be trained and certified in order to teach the IB PYP classroom? So, so I can go back to my, my, my history. Um, yeah. So prior to working at Somerset College on the Gold Coast, no, I wasn't an IB trained teacher. Right. But, okay. but the great thing about IB is that um you you tr you, tr you are given training so ib have specialist um, teachers that are trained in teaching the ib or um, informing educators how the ib can be taught so you participate very early on in your um when, when introduced to ib to a three-day workshop it's quite intensive but you're right. taught a, about the ib how to best um, teach it and implement it i i i I hope um, this is my sixth year being an IB educator. I, I feel like I am now um, got on top of the IB and the PYP, and I feel like I am now a very effective um, educator for myself. But no, you do not have to be um, a, a trained IB teacher. Yeah, we are very fortunate here, though. And I mean, we, we started actually the very our very first person, um, Brad, that we had in here was Theo Manzi. And, uh, you know, and, and Theo is uh, just for Jesus' sake. We've got teachers and leaders. Theo is a um, uh, he runs seminars to, to teach others how to teach um, that, but he's also written courses, right? Whole courses for it. So we've got experts in our staff, and he's not the only one. They're, they're, they're everywhere, aren't they? In our staff, the, the the teaching team we have here, Matt at AIS, is 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 phenomenal. The, the, we have experts in the field. Um, we have people that have been 
um, deputy principals at past schools that are now working as classroom teachers. Uh, we're, we're very fortunate to be working with some, or well, I am, some high class um, educators. And, and, and therefore the, the yeah. education that our students are receiving is, is uh, and, I, and I can speak as a parent as well, I am more, I'm yeah. so, so grateful for, for the teaching that my own two children are receiving here at AIS. And that's kind of why I introduced you, you know, at the start I said that you got the two children in here. As, as an educator, you value it, don't oh, you? Um, phenomenal. It's, it's, I, was, yeah. I was talking to a colleague the other day who's um, a friend of mine who's been at the school for 14 years, and I had to ask him, I said, so, you know, where are you guys thinking of going? And he goes, well, there's no better place for my two children to be. And I was like, well, that's, yeah. uh, that's a good point. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I thought, gosh, well, that, that's a point. Um, luckily, his two daughters have had 14, uh, have been here for all that time, but that's terrific. I've got a question here from Sarah, and um, uh, I think you might understand it a, bit, a little bit better than me. She said, um, I love how you explained how technology has been brought into the classroom. I've heard PYP is taught differently at different schools. I'm keen to understand how AIS ensure you balance teacher instruction and student inquiry with the PYP so I think we're, yeah. so, um, are we talking about the exhibition Matt I think she's just talking about explicit instruction versus um, uh, inquiry learning okay so right. I guess with the exhibition that's more um, inquiry or genuine inquiry learning that takes place but within um, yep. our uh, units of inquiry leading up to the exhibition that is more um, inquiry based with explicit teaching because we are really wanting our students to have the the knowledge the know-how and the learnings to then um, use those right. into the exhibition well what, what I will say about the exhibition is that at the end of the year five um, school year in term four it isn't just inquiry learning is taking place within the exhibition we are able to also introduce things like a language so our students are writing a hybrid text based on their global issue. They're um, engaging in statistics um, and graphing when conducting surveys um, with, with members of our community um, yep. um, based on, again, on their, on their global issue. So our exhibition, yes, it's a huge focus and it, it takes a lot of time and energy, but we're also encompassing our other learning areas um, into that exhibition. For example, reading. Reading, it, it's, it's research. So the students are reading from websites. They're learning how to summarize um, correctly. As I mentioned earlier, the students have learned how to um, write a, a bibliography um, correctly um, and things like that. So the yeah. exhibition is, I guess, the vehicle um, that allows other learning to take place. And that's what we were talking about before, authentic learning. They're seeing the purpose of knowing how to read better. Like you just said, you're reading uh, research skills, comprehension skills that they then put in place when they go and do it. Like you just said, the bibliography, then if it's area or um, statistics they need to learn, you then do explicit teaching on statistics. 100%. That's right. Um, um, you're, you're, you're constantly conferring. Um, sitting with hearing a, a student uh, read and then that's when you are noticing okay I can see that this small group needs help with this particular type of um, strategy or, um, or skill mm. and that's when you're bringing students down with you to the mat to give that explicit instruction. Cool I've, I've got another question here from Michelle she's got some good ones um, she said um, how does this AIS balance the PYP curriculum with the Australian curriculum or they might you might be able to you know, jump on this I could jump on this but let's go well, <laughs> yes so the PYP is, is is a framework it's not so much a, a curriculum um, so that allows us to um, frame our learning or for our students aligning ourselves with the Australian curriculum because we are meeting the um, Australian curriculum um, I guess um, markers or, or deadlines for that's right and that's, that's that's the really important one there for you, Michelle. So, like I said, it's a bit of a um, misconception. The the reason that the PYP can go around the world is you use that country's curriculum, or and then the PYP is more an approach to how you put that in there, which is 
that's an awesome question, Michelle, and there's lots of parents that ask us that, and you answered that um, beautifully, Brad. Um, is there any, I don't, we're, we're running out of questions from the audience, and I think we're, we're coming to the end of our time, but if anyone in the audience has any questions afterwards, please write back to anyone in our admissions team, and that is just admissions at ais.com.sg, and please write that. Oh, sorry, I've got one more question. I've got a, sorry, and I missed this before. I Please uh, apologize for this. I think it's a, a Z, I, if I pronounce that correctly. How does it work in your classroom for a dyslexic student? So we're very we're very lucky, we're very lucky, Matt, to have a number of um, learning support people um, within our grade. So within Year Five, we have um, um, teacher assistants um, hmm. and also a, a, what we call a learning support teacher. So her right. her role is to help support um, students with dyslexia. Um, yes. So we've so we're very mindful that it's not just the classroom teacher that's helping the student. We're also guided by with the support of a, of a learning um, enhancement teacher. I think that's awesome. And I think what you've touched on a, a lot today, Brad, and really, and really beautifully is the use of technology. And if we think about that, for example, before technology came along, for me to express my learning, I had to write everything down. I had to write everything. And again, for a dyslexic, that, that's quite difficult. Yeah. However, you just beautifully showed a student can video themselves expressing and explaining their learning without having to be writing it down. Right. So with any student, we, we, we find out what's best for them. So if we understand a student works best in a particular way, that is yeah. how we will uh, help that, that student. Yeah, and, and that's, the again, it couldn't, uh, to be, and I say this, and dyslexia, which I, is is a gift, not not a, um, a disability, which really has always driven me crazy. It's a gift because of the way their brain works is, is is just differently, and the way they look at text is different. So there's so many things too that's beautiful. These days, I just talked to someone the other day who's talking about um, the the audio books um, that they have that that can really help a, a dyslexic kind of because they're, they're hearing them. Do you use those in your class? Have you used some audio books and things? I know, I know students do use audiobooks, and, and, and I'm, in, like I mentioned earlier, reading partnerships. I'm not just saying, okay, we're reading a book. If, if an audiobook is what right. you like to hear, there's, there's, there's nothing stopping you, of course. How beautiful. And that would help so much with seeing text, hearing text, being spoken, and looking at it that way. And as um, I said, we have many experts available to, to us as well, Matt. So mm -hmm. any advice or suggestions to, to help any student? Um, to make the most of their uh, learning in the classroom, uh, we we listen, we adhere to, and we try different strategies and, and different avenues to get to get the best out of our students. That's terrific. And again, it, it, and I say it, and I, it's lucky being a school of scale because we can have um, learning support, which are experts in um, assisting children with um, different learning requirements. And, and and that is something that you just wouldn't get in a smaller school, right? You, you just wouldn't get that level of expertise to assist. Um, exactly. And I think you've answered all those questions beautifully. Um, a lot of people are saying, thank you, Brad, which is very nice. Michelle was happy with your question about before. I said, like, that was excellent. I think what we're going to do is we are going to finish up now, Brad. So thank you very much for your time this evening. Um, I know the audience would have greatly appreciated it. It is recorded this session, so that we um, we will we can uh, share that with people who haven't um, who missed it, or if someone would like to listen to it again. Um, uh, Melinda's just said thank you, Brad. Um, Jermaine's saying thank you as well. Uh, Chandra's saying thank you. So, Brad, you're just wonderful, mate. Really exciting to talk to you. Thanks very much for your time, and uh, we will, we will leave it at that. Great. Right. Thank you so much, Matt. Really appreciate it. And thank you to the audience as well. It's been fantastic. So thank you. All right. Terrific. All right. Let me finish that off. All right. We're going to exit it. Take care. Have a good evening, people. Bye-bye.